I think we're all fascinated with the transfiguration of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we read from 2 Peter chapter 1 this evening because that is a divine commentary on what it really was all about. There is a value in miracles, is there not? They create remembrance. They also can consolidate one's convictions that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So the Apostle Peter, in writing this second letter in chapter 1, from whence uh, our brother began to read, verse 12, 12, actually now uses three cognate words in the, in the Greek language. You can see them up here. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce them, but you will see that there is a commonality about those three words. In verse 12, when he says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance, this is about reminding quietly, suggesting to the memory. In verse 13, he says, I'm going to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Again, it's a reminding or a recollection that he has in mind. And then when he speaks about his own exodus, and I'm sure you're aware that in verse 15, when Peter writes, Moreover, I will endeavour that ye may be able, after my decease, that the Greek word there is exodus, to have these things always in your memory, as the word means. And so he then proceeds to talk about his experience along uh, with his brethren on the mount with the Lord at the transfiguration. And in verse 16 he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power, the dunamis and the coming, the parousia, the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now we've taken our title, of course, from verse 17 of this chapter. But he goes on to say this. There's an emphasis here we must not miss, and this will be the core of our study here tonight. He says in verse 18, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So there's an emphasis on the voice. Yes, there is a value in miracles. There is a power in them. You know, I can well remember as being a very young brother in Christ, just newly baptised in 1967, that in the ecclesia that I belonged to, just after the events of the Six Day War, it was an ecclesia of 250 members, by the way, you could not find a place to sit in the hall at any meeting. Leave alone the study classes. You could not find a place to sit. It was standing room only. And we saw people come back to the meetings at that time whom we hadn't seen for years. The events of the Six Day War were so miraculous and it was so obvious that Scripture was being fulfilled that people crowded into the Christadelphian halls. Guess what, brothers and sisters? Most of them only stayed for a short while. As time went on, things went back to normal they disappeared again, and you could easily find a seat. What's the problem there, do you think? Well, the problem is, you see, they were stirred up by miracles. And there's no doubt that the 1967 Six-Day War was a miracle. How could a nation of three million people defeat an aggregate conglomeration of nations of 111 million people supplied with weapons by Russia? How could they do that? Well, of course, they claim it was by their own hand. But we know differently. But you see, miracles don't actually convert people. They might convince you of something. They might convince you, for, ex for example, that Israel are God's people. But it's the word of God that creates and maintains faith. It's the word of God that shapes character. And that's why Peter's emphasis changes here. And he comes down to verse 19 and he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now by prophecy he means teaching, not prophecy in the sense of foretelling the future. Proof of that lies in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, there were also false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So he's actually talking about teaching and he has in, here, in mind here the whole word of God, because he goes on to say a little later on that no scripture is of any private unloosing, for the prophecy or the teaching came not 
in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were driven, as that word moved there could be rendered, they were driven by the Holy Spirit. That Greek word is actually used in Acts 27, verse 17, when Paul, in the ship, was driven with fierce winds. They had no control over that. So the men who wrote the scripture were driven by the Holy Spirit. So miracles can provide assurance, but they do not create faith. We know what creates faith. Romans 10, verse 17 is very plain about that, isn't it? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the final objective that Peter has in mind in his epistle here is what he calls epignosis. You might have a look at, at uh, verses, uh, verse 3 in particular. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life, and he means eternal life and godliness, through the knowledge, the epignosis, the full discernment of what God has done in Christ, calling us to glory and virtue. Wherefore, he says, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So miracles have their part. I've seen a couple in my time. Yes, I saw the events of 1967. And I think most of us can say, yes, clearly saw the hand of God in the events that have occurred in one thing or another. But it's the word of God that will create character. Miracles create awe and respect. They don't change character for the better. That is developed by stages. And in verses 5 to 7 of this first chapter of the second letter, Peter sets that out. He says, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness, and then love. See, so there are eight characteristics here that have to be developed. And these are developed in life by the power of the word of God, shaping our thinking, shaping our approach to all of the trials and the tests that are applied to us. That's what shapes character. Now, brothers and sisters, that's essentially what the transfiguration was about. Now, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that this word transfiguration is a word that doesn't occur all that frequently. It's the Greek word metamorpho, from whence we have our English word metamorphosis. It means to change the form or to transform. There are only four occurrences of this word in the New Testament. The first two of them, Matthew 17 verse 2 and Mark 9 verse 2, are in relation to the transfiguration of Christ. Then we have Romans 12 verse 2, and because of time I'm not going to speak about that now. I have something interesting to say about Romans 12, but uh, we might keep that until the, the end perhaps. But we will come in due time to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. So here we've got this word. In Romans 12 verse 2 it actually is rendered transformed and it's about the transformation of the mind by the renewal of the thinking process. But as I said, I'll leave the rest for later. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 it's translated in the authorised version as changed. And this is about the transformation of character by mirroring the character of Christ. As I said, we will come to that one in due course, God willing. So this is metamorphosis, and I guess most of us are quite familiar with this process. We have this, this hungry caterpillar, an unproductive consumer who does uh, enormous damage to those who are gardeners, uh, and he just eats and eats and eats. So this is a process that takes this caterpillar from this rather well ugly creature to this beautiful creature over here, in this case the monarch butterfly. From the ugly to the beautiful, by a process of dying in order to live anew. That's essentially what metamorphosis is about. Can I ask you to come with me to Colossians chapter 3, please? Because here we have this process, the word's not used here, but the process is definitely referred to in Colossians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul, of course, in that chapter, he begins in verse 1 by exhorting his brethren... To live in a newness of life. Verse 1 he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, the word means the operation of the mind, on things above and not on things on the earth. And he tells us what the things on the earth are in verse 5. Things that we won't have to worry about here tonight. But that's what he wants us to leave behind. Then he says this, verse 3. For ye are dead, 
And your life is hid with Christ in God. Well, yes, we are dead in the sense that we died unto the old man. When we were baptised, we died to the old man and now we live in the newness of life after the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. We seek the things which are above. And he says, your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, that is, be manifested, then shall he also appear with him in glory. So what happens is that this hungry caterpillar, having consumed a great deal of food, then creates a chrysalis. And it hides away in here. It's effectively dead. You know, I've been watching one of these at home, which is stuck on our water tank. It's been there for 11 years. It's a cicada, and they take 11 years to emerge. I'm hoping that when I go home, it'll be gone. Okay? So that's a a long, slow process. And that little creature is effectively dead. There was a complete change taking place in the chrysalis. And then comes the day of phanerosis. That's the word that Paul uses here in verse 4. Phaneru. He says... When Christ, who is our life, shall phaneru, be manifested. So, he says, we also will appear with him in glory. So that's what we're looking forward to, brothers and sisters. But you see, we're actually in this stage now, those of us who are baptised in Christ. Our life is hid with Christ in God. What a wonderful phrase that is. And in this chrysalis, so to speak, the ecclesial chrysalis, the brotherhood chrysalis, chrysalis we are being changed and we are going to be manifested in the day of his appearing so this subject of transfiguration is very important to us isn't it we're going to talk about the principles involved in that this evening now can we come back to the record of Matthew 16 and 17 where we have Christ being transfigured before his brethren. Now I have to be pretty quick in this but I I think I'm speaking to an audience that knows their Bible pretty well so I don't have to sort of go down every nook and cranny. I'm going to give you a a sketch first of all of the context in which we find ourselves. In Matthew 16 verse 28 he's just come down from the mountain. He's been talking about dying and of course Peter rebukes him and the Lord returns the rebuke to Peter. And then he says this in verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He means Peter, James and John. They were going to be there at the transfiguration. So the transfiguration was really about the kingdom coming. In other words, they would see him, brothers and sisters, as we will see him in the day of his glory. They were going to see him as he will be seen in the kingdom. What a privilege that was. Little wonder he writes the way he does in the second of Peter chapter 1. So then, in chapter 17 verse 2, it's the time of the apocalypse of Christ. He was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. In verses 6 and 7, it's the time of the resurrection of the dead. We read there, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. So figuratively, they're dead. They've fallen on their face, like Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. It was a symbol or a figure of his death from which he was raised. And verse 7, Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Get the idea of that? It's the time of the resurrection of the dead. In verse 3 of this chapter, we find that there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And in the companion account of Luke 9, we, we read that they were there in glory, as they will be seen as immortals in the kingdom age. So it's the time when the saints appear in glory. In verse 11, Elijah comes and restores Israel. That's going to be the work, of course. It's going to start pretty soon, brothers and sisters. In verse 20 of this chapter, a great mountain is removed. And there will have to be a great mountain removed before the kingdom of God can be fully established. It's the mountain of Babylon, Zechariah 4, verse 7. In verses 15 to 18 of Matthew 17, we have the epileptic child cured. And of course, he had what was called in ancient times, 
falling sickness. That's what they used to call epilepsy. You fell down the ground. That was symbolic of the nature that we were born with. We've all got falling sickness. I don't think there's anybody in this audience who would claim not to have fallen in life. We all fall into sin, don't we? We've all got that disease. And the Lord Jesus Christ cures this child to illustrate that he has the power so to do. And then in verse 20 we read of a mustard seed which which grows, the smallest of all seeds, and grows and fills the whole earth, so to speak, symbolic of the kingdom of God. So this is the framework around which the transfiguration occurs. Now, obviously, I can't talk about all of those things tonight, and I'm not even going to try. We're just going to focus on one or two aspects of this subject. But to do so, we need to go back to the roots of the transfiguration. We need to come back to Matthew chapter 15. What we're going to see is that this whole context here revolves around Matthew 16, verse 4, where mention is made of the sign of the prophet Jonah. It's very important in relation to the transfiguration, as we shall see. So what's the context? Now, Matthew 15 can basically be divided into two sections. From verses 1 to 20 deals with the subject of Judaism and its leaders repudiated. From verse 21 onwards, we have the conversion of Gentiles, where Christ is in the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. So on the one hand, we've got the repudiation of Judaism by the Lord. He talks about washing hands and all that sort of stuff. Verses 21 onwards, he goes about doing things which illustrate he had a work amongst the Gentiles. So he heals the daughter of the woman of Canaan. I think most of you are also aware that in verse 26... When he says it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs, he doesn't use the normal word for dogs. He uses the word cunarion, which means a puppy. In those days, dogs were outside the house, but they let puppies inside, and this woman grabbed it. He dropped a crumb off the table, brothers and sisters, and she grabbed it. She knew that puppies were allowed inside. She says, I'll have that crumb, thanks, Lord. He cures her daughter. I haven't found faith like that in Israel. And she's a Phoenician woman. In verse 29 of this chapter, we read that he was nigh unto the Sea of Galilee. And we all know that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, Galilee is called Galilee of the nations. In verse 31, there is a clear allusion to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, because he talks about all the things that, that the prophecy said he would do. The dumb to speak, and the maimed to behold, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And it ends with these words... But they glorified the God of Israel in verse 31. Now, if these were Jews, it would have said they glorified God. When it says they glorified the God of Israel, it's quite plain. They were Gentiles. And you've only got to go back to Isaiah 61. And guess what the context is about? It's about salvation coming to Gentiles. So this is very important to us, isn't it? Because all of us probably come from the Gentiles. Once Gentiles in the flesh. Verse 32, he takes three days journey. Okay? And this reminds us of Jonah, doesn't it? A three-day journey across Nineveh. And in verse 38 of this chapter, it says, They that did, that did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. They are mostly Gentiles, this 4,000, brought into the covenant, brothers and sisters. Verse says this in verse 39. And he sent away the multitude and took ship. Why? But why does he get into a boat now? Well, because you see, he has Jonah in mind. And then we have a discussion about foul weather. Verse 3 of chapter 16. In the morning it will be foul weather today. Well, you see, Jonah got into a boat, didn't he? And foul weather came upon him. And we know the rest of the story. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that in John chapter 7 and at verse 52... The Pharisees and the scribes said, Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, they said. Of course, they were ignorant. Jonah was the only Old Testament prophet from Galilee. He came from a place called gath Hepha, the wine press of the well. It was about three miles from Nazareth, so it wasn't that far from the place where the Lord grew up. It just so happens, of course, that in the Hebrew, the root of hepha means to pry into, to search, to dig, or to explore. Now, they hadn't been doing much digging, had they? 
Because if they'd been digging around in their Bible, they would have known that Jonah was from Galilee. And they wouldn't have made this foolish statement. Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. There was only one from Galilee, and that's why the Lord focuses on him so much. And here in this context it's very important because you see Jonah, the dove his name means, is a symbol of the spirit. He's the son of Amittai, we read in the Old Testament. Voracious from Emeth, one of the, one of the words that God uses of his own character in Exodus 34 verse 6, to which we will come a little later. And then we read this in Matthew 16 and verse 17. Did you notice I'm sort of just skipping over a few things here? I have to do that. So I'm hoping you're catching on to this. Look at verse 17. We know what happens. They go to the mount. Lord asks the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? We come down to verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he's called Simon Peter in verse 16. But look at verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. The hearing, because that's what Simon or Simeon means in Hebrew, the hearing son of the dove, or the spirit. So here is one who could make a statement, the Lord says, you've got that right. I wonder where you got that from. That was not given to you by me, was it, Peter? That came from God. So here was a man whose ears were open. He was the hearing son of the Spirit. Little wonder that Peter talks about this in his second letter. And in the first, actually, as well. Now, what did Jonah do? Well, Jonah evaded his duty to preach to Gentiles. And he escaped from Joppa and ran into foul weather in the ship. And Peter himself was to be tested at Joppa, wasn't he? In Acts chapter 10 we read about that. Was he willing to use the keys of the kingdom which were given to him here in Matthew 16 to open the door of faith to the Gentiles? Can I just add one word about the keys of the kingdom here, brothers and sisters? I don't have time to go into it. But the keys of the kingdom are laid out here in Matthew 16. They are the sufferings of Christ, that's key one, and the glory that would follow. If you want to check out the words I've just used, they come straight from the first of Peter, chapter 1, verse 11. And it's a wonderful exercise to work through that first letter of Peter. And you'll find that he repeats over and over again those two things. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. It all comes from Psalm 22, by the way. Psalm 22 is divided into two sections. The first is about the sufferings of Christ. And the second section, from the halfway through verse 21, is about the glory that would follow. So these are the two keys. That's why Christ goes on now to talk about those two things in this chapter. Verse 21, he says, He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and scribes and priests and be killed. But what would follow? He would be raised again the third day. And what would that lead to? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, he says in verse 27, with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. So you see there are two keys. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. And Peter was to use those, of course, on two occasions. To the Jews in Acts chapter 2 and to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But Peter had a reluctance, didn't he? He had a real reluctance. That's why Jesus calls him Simon, son of Jonah. You ready for this? A bit more progress needed here, Peter. Thou art Peter, Petros, a movable stone. But Peter, you have made a very important statement. So he's called Cephas in John 1.42, which means a rock or a stone. Okay? Thou art Peter. Petros is the, is the Greek word. A piece of rock or a stone that can be moved about. But what about his statement? Well, the statement he makes in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16 is the platform, the foundation upon which Christ would build his ecclesia. It was this statement. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's nothing movable about, about that, is there? Peter might be movable, but there's nothing movable about that. 
And that was the, the strong, firm, immovable foundation upon which Christ was to build his ecclesia. So that's just a sketch, brothers and sisters, of the, the background that leads to this wonderful event of the transfiguration of Christ. Now, we could go down many paths at this point, but we can't do that. We've got to stick with the thing that we have elected to deal with tonight, and that is the power of the Word of God. Miracles can make you sit up and take notice. They can't change your life. The Word of God does that. So I want to ask the question. In verse 3 of chapter 17, we read... And behold, there appeared unto them, this is on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah talking with him. So why choose Moses and Elijah? Why not David and Abraham? Why not any other combination? Why Moses and Elijah? Well, of course, we've come up with many answers to that question over the years. Was it because they are both leaders of an exodus and Christ was speaking of his exodus, which he does in Luke chapter 9, verse 31? That he would have an exodus. Yes, Peter actually picks that language up, as we read in 2 Peter 1.15. Or were there more important reasons? Well, I believe there's some very important reasons. Because both Moses and Elijah were taught a very vital lesson in the same place. Men are not changed for the kingdom by miracles, but by hearing and believing the word of God. So I want you to join me. Back in Exodus chapter 33, please. Now, as you're coming back there, I just want to lay a couple of things before you which will be important for us to notice in the two contexts that we will have a look at briefly. It is this phrase, passed by. It connects the record of Moses on Mount Horeb, which we'll look at in Exodus 33, 34, with that of Elijah on the same mount, probably in the same cave, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 14. It also links the above events with the call of Elisha to service in in Elijah's stead, which we'll have a look at in 1 Kings 19, verses 19 to 21. All of the above laid the foundation for the events of the transfiguration in which Moses and Elijah passed by, as we're going to see, and finally even the bright cloud, and then the voice, pass by, so that Jesus was found alone. And he, brothers and sisters, was the word made flesh. He was the voice of God made flesh. The very expression, the exposition of the mind and character of God made flesh. So that's where we're leading. So you've got a bit of an idea where I'm going to steer you. All I need is your focus for the next few minutes. So let's come back and have a look at Exodus 33 and verses 12 to 23 very quickly. Now the background of this is of course the sin of the golden calf. The outcome of that was that God disfellowshipped Israel. And I use that phrase advisedly. He was out of fellowship with Israel. And he withdraws the angel of his presence and says, I'll send you another angel. We read that in Exodus 33 and verse 2. He says, I will send an angel before thee and I will drive out the Canaanite. But it's not the angel that he gave them in Exodus 23. Have a look down at verse 3 of Exodus 33. I'll take you unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. So he's going to withdraw what Isaiah 63 verse 9 calls the angel of his presence who had the authority from God to forgive and condemn sin. He's just going to send another angel. A lesser angel. Because he says, I'm not going up in the midst. I cannot walk with corruption, Israel. And that angel personally represents me. I'm not going. And Moses says, well, we we can't make it. We're not going to get there. And the people realised this. Have a look at verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. No man did put on him his ornaments. 
And God says to them, you're a stiff-necked people, he says in verse 5. I will come up into the midst of you in a moment and consume thee. Put off thine ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. And they stripped themselves of their ornaments and they stood there awestruck as they watched Moses take the tent in which he used to meet the angel face to face. And we read about that in verse 11 of this chapter. He used to talk to this angel of God's presence face to face and so brilliant was his countenance that it shone on Moses' face and when he came out there was a a luminosity about his face. And he would speak to the people and then put a veil upon his face. You know the story. God says, I'm taking that angel away. And so Moses picks up the tent where he used to meet with this angel and he takes it outside the camp. And the cloud which stood above it goes outside the camp. And the people know that God is out of fellowship with them. So we read that they respond to this. They stood there in verse 8 and watched all of this happen. They saw the cloud go out in verse 9 and in verse 10. All the people rose up and worshipped. What that means in the Hebrew is they got up and then bowed on their faces. They capitulated to this. They knew what had happened. Brothers and sisters, Moses now goes back into the camp and pleads that God might return. And he asks for two things. In verse 13 he says, Show me now thy way. And in verse 18 he says, Show me thy glory. And what he wants to see is the full glory of God manifested in the face of the angel who's been taken away. He's pleased. He's in the middle of the camp now. He's pleading. You've seen the people. They've repented. Please. And God answers him and says, yes, I'll do that. But there's limitations, Moses. Limitations. He says in verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will... Proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious unto whom I will be gracious. But verse 20 he says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So let's summarise all of this. Moses intercedes for a disfellowshipped Israel from the midst of the camp, and the basis of reconciliation has been laid in Israel's humble prostration in acknowledging their position. And God accedes to Moses' request, My presence, he says, shall go with thee. It had been withdrawn in verse 9. And Moses is encouraged then to make this astonishing request. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So God says, yes, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, both both physical and moral. But thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me. That word man is Adam. No Adam shall see me in the full manifestation of my glory and live. And verse 21, he says, I'm going to put you in the cliff of a rock and I will pass by. Now, here are our words. Verse 22. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I'll put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand, while I pass by. The word hand here is cat. Elsewhere translated clouds. I'm going to put a hand or a cloud over your face, Moses. And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? And the Lord passed by in chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. This was the angel of his presence. The angel referred to by Stephen in Acts 7.38. Manifesting the full glory of God on this occasion, which could not be seen face to face as Moses had talked to him previously. This was the full manifestation. And Rotherham's translation of verse 6 is on the screen. Brothers and sisters, verse 6 says this, And the Lord passed by. So what Moses saw was the receding glory. He couldn't see it face to face. He saw the receding glory. It disappears. And then he heard a voice. And the voice spoke these words about the power of our God full of compassion and favour, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and faithfulness. I ask you a question, brothers and sisters, who's the most influential person in your meeting? Is it the bombastic Australian who comes and visits you once every several years? Is it the person with the loudest voice in business meetings? Is it the person who insists on their own way and gets it by whatever means? Is it? 
or is it the brother or sister who's the manifestation of the divine character? And it's obvious to everyone where that's come from. Well, I'll tell you, you want real power, that's where it resides. It resides in character. And that's the lesson God's teaching Moses. Yes, you asked to see my full physical glory. And you'll see it receding. And I will pass by. And then we get a voice. And it's the voice that we need to recognise as the great power here. I was going to talk about verses 10 and onwards. Just take Psalm 103 verse 7. It's a commentary on verse 10. Before all thy people I will do marvels. Psalm 103 verse 7 says, He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. I want you to come now to 1 Kings 19. Same place, same mountain, probably the same cave. 1 Kings chapter 19. We know the story. Chapter 18, fire from heaven. Consume the sacrifice on Mount Carmel. The people of Israel crash to their faces and say, we know who God is now. And Elijah thinks, you beauty, this is going to be a wonderful reformation. These people are ready. Yeah, it's a miracle. You see, they've seen a miracle. Miracles can sit up and make you sit up and take notice. But it's teaching that changes people. And he goes down before the chariot of Ahab and comes face to face with Jezebel. And then he runs off to Horeb. To plead against Israel, says Paul in Romans 11. And God says to him, when he gets down there after a 40 day journey, he says, what are you doing here Elijah? The miracle of Mount Carmel prepared my people for education. What are you doing here? Why aren't you back there teaching my people? But of course we know he had this soliloquy ready and he gives it twice in response to the same question. But where does he come? Well in verse 9 of First Kings 19. He came thither unto Horeb to a cave and he lodged there and behold the word of the Lord came to him. Notice the phrase, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here? Elijah. And he comes out, verse 10, and says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy orders, and I, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Well, one person sought his life, not the nation. And he said, that if God says to him, I'm going to teach you a lesson, Elijah. See, there's a cave he's in. Yeah, might it have been the same cave that Moses was put in? We don't know. But I think it probably was. Because the same lesson is taught in this place. We read in verse 11. God says to him, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Here's our phrase. Passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But he was not in the wind. Now, what does it mean, brothers and sisters, that he was not in the wind? When was the last time that you saw a wind that could break the rocks in pieces? Come from Sidmouth, you can't answer this question. Because down there the cliffs are falling over from the winds and the waves, aren't they? But when was the last time you saw wind breaking the rocks into pieces? Well, you don't see it, do you? This is a divine power. This wind comes directly from the hand of God. So clearly God is in it in that sense. His power is manifested in a miracle. So what does it mean when he says that he was not in the wind? Well, this is why the, the phrase passed by is very important. You see, the wind breaks the rocks in pieces and Elijah, who, who had originally stood out at the lip of the cave, we know from a later verse actually goes into the back of the cave he's got his head wrapped in his mantle and he's hiding in the back of the cave because of the terrible things that are going on out there he's frightened out of his skin by what he hears and sees but you see then it all dies down 
the wind dies away. It's passed by. And then comes an earthquake in verse 11. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Why? Because eventually the earthquake stopped. It had passed by. And where was God to be found? Now that his power was no longer manifest, it's passed by. Same with the fire. And after the earthquake in verse 12, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. So here we've got these three things. Wind, earthquake and fire. And they all pass by. But then read with me the end of verse 12 and verse 13. And after the fire, a still small voice. Or as Rotherham translates it, the voice of a gentle whisper. And then the record says this, and it was so when Elijah heard. Now the word it's in italics, you can cross it out. When Elijah heard that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. That's where he started. But you see, he has been chased back by this manifestation of power to the back of the cave, hiding his face in the mantle. And it takes a while, doesn't it? If you've got, a, you've got something wrapped around your head, it takes a while for you to hear what's going on outside. And eventually he says, what's that I hear? And it was a voice that kept on saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, the voice of a gentle whisper. And it took quite some time for him to hear it. You know what God's teaching him, brothers and sisters? Elijah, you called down fire from heaven and I sent my power in a miracle. It consumed your sacrifice and the altar and everything else. My people fell on their faces and declared me to be their God. They were ready to listen. But it takes a while, Elijah. What are you doing down here? When you should be back teaching them. When you should be my voice in Israel. Persistent. Teaching. What are you doing here? Got that, brothers and sisters? If you have been frightened out of your skin by miracles, Elijah, and it's taken you a while to hear, and I've had to keep on saying this over and over and over again, what about your people, Israel? My people that you've asked me to destroy. What about them? Why aren't you back there teaching? That's the lesson of that, brothers and sisters. You see, what happened is that God now asks him again, what are you doing here? And he gets the same answer in verse 14. So in verse 15, he says this to Elijah, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Hazael? Well, yes, he's the wind. Winds came into Israel from the east, from Syria. Anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, well, what did he do? Well, he brought the greatest political earthquake in Israel's history. He completely eradicated Baal worship from Israel. And Elisha, whose name is the son of Shaphat, the son of judgment. And, of course, the symbol for judgment in the Bible is fire. Yes, but he was to become God's voice in Israel. And some in Israel were ready to listen, weren't they? And so when Elijah comes to him in 1 Kings 19 and verse 19, we read this. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen, twelve the number of Israel, and he before them, he with the twelve, I should say, Elijah, look at the words, passed by him. So the era of Elijah was to pass by and to be replaced by the era of Elisha, God's still small voice in Israel is to become the voice of a gentle whisper finally brothers and sisters I need to sit down Luke chapter 9 quickly let's have a look at the culmination of all of this Luke chapter 9 this is the other record one of the other records of the transfiguration we don't need to read the introductory verses from verse 28 
down to verse 31. Let's just pick it up from verse 32. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud. Matthew says it was a bright cloud. There was the brilliance of divine glory in this cloud. And it overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered into the cloud. How come? They entered into the cloud. Did they move? No. The cloud was moving. It was passing by. It had the glory of God in it as well. It was passing by. Verse 35. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Look at the next words in your Bible. And when the voice was passed, so even the voice passed by. We read these words. Jesus was found alone. No longer glory in glory, no longer shining. Just a word made flesh. That's the lesson of that, brothers and sisters. You don't think that's correct. Have a look at verses 43 and 44. Verse 43. They were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, every one at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples. They marveled at his miracles. He said to his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears. You see, it's about... The word changing people. They marvel at the miracles. He says, no, no, no. Listen to what I'm saying. The word of God was manifested in a man. In his teachings, he was passing that word on to others that they might, like him, manifest it. That's what forms character, brothers and sisters. And the Apostle Paul says the same thing, basing his words upon Moses coming down from the mountain and we all with unveiled face, he says, not like the Jews who have a veil over their face to this day, we behold the glory of the Lord in a mirror and are changed, he says. The same image are being transformed, there's our word metamorpho, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So I ask the final question, are you undergoing... A metamorphosis. Is this what's happening in your life? Can you be confident about that, brothers and sisters? Is your life hid with Christ in God? Because if it is, then that will be the sufferings part. Locked away here. These are the keys of the kingdom. But the sufferings will always precede the glory. Let us hope, brothers and sisters that when Christ does come, and he will come soon, that we'll all appear with him in glory.